We believe and have always believed in this country that man was created in the image of God, that he was given talents and responsibilities and was instructed to use them to make this world a better place in which to live. And you see, this is the really great thing of America. It's time to discover what binds us together. And finding it has the power to transform our world. That's what I believe. How about you? Well, hi, everyone. I'm Doug DeVos, and welcome to Believe. We're uh, thrilled to have you joining us again. Uh, today's topic is a, a wonderful topic uh, and talks about higher education. A lot of discussion in the marketplace about the cost of higher education, the value of higher education, and I am so thrilled to have a chance to speak with a, a great friend, the president of Purdue University, Mitch Daniels. Now, I've got my gold sweater and black jeans on, so I'm trying to be gold and black here and do the best I can to, uh, to match up, but I had a gr tremendous experience at Purdue when I attended uh, and have uh, continued to just enjoy being part of the university uh, ever since, like I'm sure many of you are with, with your alma maters. And, and and with the experience that you had. But there's a lot of questions today, and, and President Mitch Daniels has had a, a tremendous influence on innovation and creativity, and I wanna take a little time to, to think about what we all believe about higher education, be informed on that be, through uh, President Mitch Daniels. So Mitch, thank you for taking the time to join today. Really uh, looking forward to this conversation. I've looked forward to it too. Great, thank you. And, and so Mitch, let, me, let me just dive in. So first of all, uh, you have an incredible resume. You've had a lot of experiences before you joined Purdue, right? You were the governor of Indiana. You were in the uh, Bush White House. You uh, were an executive with Eli Lilly. Uh, how have some of, and even if you go back further, just your childhood, how have some of those experiences shaped you and prepared you uh, for the role that you have today? I usually start this answer by saying scar tissue. <laughs> uh, which is not completely uh, facetious because uh, uh, in, in uh, past roles, a couple of them in particular were, were public and visible. And um, you, you come to, to accept after a, a while that uh, with that territory comes a lot of criticism, sometimes in fact, frequently unfair, untrue. And, um, you know, learning to, that that just goes with the job and learning to shrug it off, not spend uh, uh, energy uh, uh, fretting over it was, was is certainly a part of it. Now, I don't want to overstate that. I've had a terrific uh, experience here at Purdue that uh, any um, uh, negative uh, uh, comments that have come with it have been pretty infrequent, but, but they do come. And some people I don't think are ready for it uh, if they are encountering it for the first or second time. I think the other answer probably is that uh, as it was in my uh, uh, public uh, uh, elected job, um, business experience over and over, I find the most valuable things that apply are not those things I might have learned, although I learned a lot, uh, in uh, White Houses or in, um, in um, uh, 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 previous uh, public life, uh, but uh, rather those things I learned um, running a, first a mid-size, then part of a bigger business, all the things that, uh, that really make society go, making ends meet and trying to bring new value to uh, willing customers. Yeah, a absolutely. So you, you've learned so much. And, and uh, when you came to Purdue, a lot of us were just thrilled uh, to have some of your leadership, your character, your experience uh, in, in this role. But one of the main things, one of the questions I kind of started with, and I want you to help us think through this, is the cost of higher ed. Huge topic today. Uh, you know, it's you know, inflation's a huge topic today. But the cost of higher ed has has risen dramatically in recent years and and, and decades. But yet, you at Purdue have been able to keep tuition level for a number of years now. And I remember the uh, talking with you very early on when you started in that journey and you were making progress on that journey of holding the cost down, uh, help us understand how you view that, 
how you think about it, what you believe about the cost uh, of an education, the value equation that I, I remember you, you, you talked about this idea of the value equation of, mm-hmm. uh, of education. So I'd love to hear your, your thoughts and help us think about that. It probably helped uh, to have come from outside the system um, that, that had its downsides. I had so much to learn. I think I'm still learning. But the, among the uh, uh, positive aspects probably was I, I arrived here it's 10 years ago now. This isn't a yeah. new topic. It was obvious even then to me. And I'd been out. I'd been the employee of uh, six and a half million citizens of our state. You can bet I'd heard a lot about the rising cost of higher education from them. And uh, uh, I frankly overestimated how uh, quickly and how severely pressure would come to bear on higher ed. I said to people at the time, we better get a handle on these costs. We better break this uh, pattern of annual increases. At Purdue, it was 36 years in a row, and that was pretty typical. Um, And I said, we better, uh, how about we take at least a one-year pause to indicate that we're listening and that we understand that this is really starting to squeeze people, particularly those of moderate means. And so uh, my only surprise about all the, the, the current focus on, on this subject is that it took as long as it did and that it was the market was as slow to start exerting its pressure as it finally has been. But, um, you know, it's not a mystery to me how it came about. Uh, two reasons. The first reason, very simple, they raised tuition because they could. Every business would love to have total pricing power, the ability to raise your price and not lose customers. And uh, it, for higher ed, it was, in fact, it was better than that. When they raised the price, some people assumed that, assumed because they had no other way to tell, they assumed that that meant the quality was better. If it cost more, must right. be better. There's no evidence of that. In many cases, is plainly wrong. But they that was a pretty nice way uh, to... Uh, do business while it lasted. The All second right. thing was the system I've sometimes said or written that if you set out to design a system that would cost too much, it would look pretty much like what we've got in higher ed. <laughs> and by, by which I mean, um, you're, uh, first of all, you're selling what has been seen at least. This is also beginning to change. It's healthy. Seen as a necessity. People really felt it was urgent for th- their child or for them to get a college diploma. And um, the uh, uh, there was no measurement of quality, as I mentioned earlier. Right. Um, the people didn't have a way to know whether they were getting good value, uh, whether they're, uh, they were going to learn a lot or a little during the time they spent in higher ed. And then uh, um, very uh, crucially, uh, you, were, you flooded the system with third party uh, subsidies, government loans and grants and so forth, so that the person or the family consuming the product didn't feel the cost, uh, or maybe they didn't feel till later when those student loan bills started arriving. Right. And so they were desensitized uh, to the price. Uh, throw into the, into the mix uh, a lot of government regulation, which um, is expensive to comply with. And, uh, and, and requires administrative people you wouldn't otherwise need to, um, to uh, teach young people. And, um, you know, you, you've got a formula for uh, a higher cost. And uh, if, if that all sounds familiar to people in the audience, someone out there is saying, oh, yeah, I've seen that before. This is American health care. Right. <laughs> with uh, third party payments and very difficult to measure quality, not a lot of transparency, et cetera. Um, and, um, uh, and it's no coincidence that the only items in the economy which have gone up in price over the last maybe four decades faster than health care are college tuition, college room and board, and college books. Oh. Wow. Well, that's a, a trifecta of uh, <laughs> of impact on people who are looking for an education, and, and you know, as we try to shape our views, because you know, sometimes you get into a world, you get in the world of academia, or you get in the, you know, I've been in situations where I feel completely removed. I feel uninformed about where I am, and you're relying on people to tell you uh, about it. And I'm sure that's a lot of people in the audience who 
you know, who, who are making a, a, a higher ed decision or whose family are making a higher ed decision. You know, this I, I idea, and because of all the talk and because of the cost, maybe there's a crisis of confidence in higher ed. More and more people are starting to wonder about the value of it for them. And of course, the value is going to be linked to the cost. So help us understand your perspective on the value uh, of education and, and that, that you see and that is being created at Purdue uh, by an, you know, an amazing faculty. And it's being created at universities across the country by amazing people. But help us understand that the value of, uh, of that experience and, and what, what a student can really take away. You're asking exactly the right and central question. This, this should always be, as most of life is, a, 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 about value. Uh, you know, what, what uh, quality uh, um, it, it does one take out of a given purchase relative to the price paid? And when higher ed is, is done well and is done at a, a price that's affordable, I think it's one of the most valuable things any person, frankly, of any age, um, because higher ed is no longer just for the 18 to 22 year old. Yeah, um, right. It's one of the most valuable things a person can do. And it's such a commonplace now because it's true that uh, we're going to be in a world of continuing or lifelong education. And um, places like Purdue have to be prepared to do that. And we are. We're offering to people who've been out of here for years the chance, if they want, to uh, to come and learn more or, or refresh what they learned before. So. Um, but I say that it has to be done right and has not always been. I don't know if crisis is the right word. It might be. But certainly there has been a sharp plummet in confidence in higher education and, uh, and pe in higher ed has no one to blame but itself, in my opinion. Uh, the, the percentage of people who, who say they see value, uh, the percentage of young people who are intend to go straight to college from high school, uh, have both dropped precipitously. The number of people on American campuses has declined now for 10 straight years. And since we're not having a lot of kids in this country, um, that those numbers are not going to reverse. So there's going to be a lot of schools, if they can't demonstrate and convince future, uh, we'll call them customers, of their value, then um, uh, they are very likely to struggle. So talk, talk about that a little bit more. So you're, you're seeing some signals. There's a lot of conversation. And of course, in the business world, there'd be an immediate response to that. You lose a little market share. You lose some sales. Yeah, Boy, a lot of people get a lot of activity. We know, <laughs> yeah, we, yeah. We know how that goes. But in business, sometimes, too, companies don't respond. And they go out of business. So are you seeing that as a possibility in higher ed? Are there going to be schools that are going to not be able to sustain, not have customers, students, not be able to attract people for their services? And, and what happens? And how should, how should they be innovating or thinking about staying relevant and creating that value? What are the, some of the things that, yeah. uh, that, that uh, you would say they should be thinking about? Well, first of all, it is happening. We've lost 70 schools by one, one count in the last five years. And um, there are many more, I think, in very, very severe straits right now. Uh, again, um, when I got to this job, people were forecasting much more radical um, shakeout than that. And again, the system has shown it has a lot of inertia in it, a lot of, uh, right. uh, you would say in business, stickiness. Right. Uh, and... Um, uh, and so th that needs to be taken into account, but the, um, it may be taking longer and moving a little more slowly, but the, the direction is very, very clear. Um, what should schools do about it? Um, you know, some are probably uh, past the point of no return. If they have backed themselves into a corner where they're charging extravagant prices for uh, courses of dubious value in today's marketplace and uh, taught at, uh, in non-rigorous ways, um, th there's not going to be a simple exit. Uh, you know, you're starting to see schools, this would be a familiar to people in business, uh, consolidated or merged. Right. Um, but, you know, one way to survive is to uh, take uh, redundancies out or uh, deduplicate back office and other functions. 
And uh, I, I just heard from a, a couple of very fine, small private um, uh, liberal arts schools in the Midwest who are going through exactly that process and want to know about how to how to make it work. So, um, you know, the it, the best thing that a that place can do, I think, if they're in that pit shape, is to um, e emphasize, if they can, um, a, a courseware that is that is uh, uh, relevant to today's marketplace, and to uh, try to uh, declare that they're going to hold high standards, both of the rigor with which things are taught, the, the integrity with which it's taught, um, and uh, the values that the university stands for. But um, uh, there's been a flight from expensive small private schools, uh, and also, I'm troubled to say, from some of our public regional schools around the country to schools like ours where people have decided, you know, the quality is pretty darn good and it doesn't, it costs a fraction as much. Right, right. And, and that's just how, how any industry gets disrupted. Uh, somebody offers a better product with better value and, and uh, people vote with their feet. They vote with their pocketbook and that's what they're doing at Purdue. So you, you've been managing costs and what are the results you've seen? We've talked about this before. I'd love to hear, hear the latest uh, on student, student quality, student achievement, uh, some of the things that you're experiencing at Purdue. You can get uh, what the, some people call the virtuous cycle going and I'd say we've been enjoying uh, a, a, a version of that. Uh, as the uh, years have gone by and as, as uh, with a, a an academic reputation that is as strong as any, certainly in our peer group, as our prices became more and more and more competitive, as we stood still, we actually reduced the cost of room and board and books. Um, uh, we've had record admission or applications every single year, and the uh, university has grown uh, substantially, um, uh, about almost 30 percent over the last decade. And so, of course, one way to uh, to uh, to, to avoid price increases is to have a very, very strong volume, strong top line, so to say, and we do. Yeah. I, I should say one other thing. It, it was thought, and frankly, I accept it as, as axiomatic when I got here, that if we grew the student body, that the quality of the incoming, the readiness of the incoming students would slip. You know, you're, you're taking you know, the next set of people you might not have accommodated before. Um, and, and to be fair to schools that, that were practicing that were becoming more selective, uh, uh, it wasn't without a, a reasonable uh, rationale, which was and remains to some extent, that graduation rates need to be better than they are. There's really nothing more um, unfortunate than people than to, to see the large numbers of people we have had who started college and didn't finish. We may want to talk in a minute about that whole subject because it's it's more important than some people realize. There are twice as many people in that category. They actually please, started. started please college. dive dive into that. Dive yeah. into that. That's absolutely critical. Yeah, no, I will. Um, uh, and and but to complete the last answer, uh, the um, uh, if you are more a little more careful about who comes in, you're you're probably going to have a higher percentage. Uh, succeed and, and go out the other side. So the rationale for a greater selectivity uh, was not at all um, nefarious. Oh, yeah, some were chasing these ratings and so forth, but uh, um, I don't think that was the case here. Well, anyway, we reversed field, and I, what I want to report is that even though the student body has grown every year, the quality has risen, not fallen. And as I say, I think we have something of a of a positive cycle going in which um, in, in which our reputation has strengthened and our reputation for value in particular. And so we are attracting um, more of the same excellent students that have that have always made up the Purdue student body. Um, now, on the other on the other side, again, it's uh, we, we now we now operate um, an online university called Purdue Global. Mm -hmm which I believe is, is absolutely, it's not only consistent with our land grant mission to spread and democratize education, 
I think it's basically an, a, a prerequisite these days. And what I, when I, reason I say that is Purdue Global serves a completely different audience. It, it serves almost entirely that group I mentioned that uh, never finished college. Right. Uh, and um, there are twice as many such people in America today than all the college students on all the campuses we spend our, most of our time talking about. And, wow, that's a that's a huge number. I, I, it is hard to imagine. I, I know, and it, they're less visible, you know. So the uh, the average or the typical student at Purdue Global is a a, a, a woman. She's likely to be a, as likely to be minority as not um, in her thirties, uh, who has some kind of job, has family responsibilities, and so forth. That sort of person is never going to be able to come back to campus to finish a degree. Right. Almost certainly not. And so we have to find other ways to help her or him do it. And with the tools of the new online um, uh, technologies, uh, we're, we're able to do that. And uh, we consider that just as noble a mission as uh, helping that bright, fresh faced 18 year old, you know, walk across the stage here four years later. Yeah. Yeah. F yeah, fantastic to think about that. Let's let's go a little bit, kind of in that vein of innovation, because you're you're part of a of a university innovation alliance. So you've been incredibly innovative at Purdue. You've you've connected with a few other you know, university uh, presidents who are thinking of these issues the same way. And and one of the things I love you talked about was you know room and board and books. Yeah, it, it, it's identifying not just the, the tuition cost, but the other cost maybe of attending and, and being active about it and creating value in, in those places as well. But maybe, maybe not specifically, but help us understand or how, how, should we, uh, you know, how should we be thinking about the work you're doing with other college presidents to try to reform, if you will, the industry or the, or, or the function of higher ed uh, in our society? I always try not to hold ourselves out as a as a, a model for anybody else. You know, the, right. the decisions we've made, we believe, are right for Purdue and for our mission and for our uh, values and tradition. Um, they may or may not apply elsewhere. I will just say that I do think that, uh, as we've been discussing, that um, that the uh, the marketplace is beginning to, I'll say, sensitize other universities more and more to this to this problem and it's about time. Um, you know, we've, uh, uh, I smile when, a little when people say, as you just did, or we get some award and we've gotten a few for being innovative. And, and of course we do try and we don't consider ourselves, um, uh, you know, trapped. We, uh, we try not to be trapped in old ways of or doing things just because they've worked in the past you know, the dangers of that in business or anywhere else. Sure. But um, uh, I, I usually laugh about it because, it, you know, it's just, I'm sorry to say, it's not too hard to stand out. I mean, uh, in higher ed, it, um, <laughs> very interesting. There are a bunch of ironies that I've taken note of here. and One of them is that people in higher ed, they're very, very bright, and they think of themselves as very, you know, future and forward-looking, progressive, and so forth. But in terms of how these oper these institutions operate, they're about the stodgiest, most hidebound, reactionary places I've ever seen. Right. And so you do something that's just a little bit different, and people get uh, you know take note and are impressed. <laughs> you, you, you may remember I, I wrote in one of my annual letters that we'd just gotten a couple more awards for most innovative college or something like that. And I said, well, that was nice to see. I said, but you know. When um, when you're driving 10 miles an hour, but the traffic's only going two, people think you're a Ferrari. Sure. And, you know, we're, we're just really not that good. We've got a lot of work left to do. <laughs> well, I think, you know, in, in life, we all feel that way sometimes, but we got to do what we can. And right. if you're, you know, if, if you're going 10 and the rest of the world's going two, you're making progress. Yeah. And, and, and we have to all keep trying to figure out how to do that. Let, tell, let me let just one more thing on this subject sure. that's, that's been more and more clear over time. Uh, and I've mentioned our people, if, if you just develop uh, some sort of a, 
track record of doing things a little differently, being willing to experiment with a new idea. Uh, you don't have to be so darn smart because people bring their ideas to you. Right. And I think, oh, those those crazy folks at Purdue probably try this, you know, and uh, there's, been a, <laughs> there's been several technologies. If I look out this window right now. I see these little white um, uh, uh, rectangular robots running around all over the campus there. And we were the first place. It's a company called Starship. So you can call up and they'll deliver anything from your pizza, your cheeseburger, or your Starbucks. The robot will bring it to you and it, you'll open it with your, you know, the phone, a code on your phone. And they're ubiquitous on our campus. Uh, they're, the company's doing well. They're now apparently on 20 some campuses, but we weren't first. Why? I wow. think because they, uh, they figured that we'd be um, a little more than others to yeah. give it a whirl. Yeah. Oh, that's a, that's a great story. Uh, if I could figure out how to place an order on my phone and do that sort of stuff, then maybe I could be a customer as well. But I, I may have to have my children help me. Well, you come <laughs> down here. It's not hard. I've done it. All right. Well, good. I, I have confidence. Let, let me shift gears a, a, a little bit. Staying on, on, on a, a similar vein, maybe not exactly of innovation, but of leadership. I, I, I watched your address uh, at the graduation last spring, spring of you know, 21, uh, for the graduating class. And there was a lot packed in there coming out of COVID. Uh, you did a lot of things. Purdue did a lot of things that other schools didn't do. Again, it was innovative, but it, it required leadership. It required stepping out. And you talked a lot about... Uh, about how leaders have to balance risks. You can't have an aversion to risk. That, and you 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 talked about even how sometimes you know current leaders have failed uh, when when they you know they were so fearful of uncertainty that they didn't take all the other interests uh, in, into account. Help us understand how you and the and the university thought through the response to COVID in the early days and the mid days and how you were, were able to um, be a bit of a pioneer uh, and, and continue to deliver services in the best way you thought possible uh, to your students. Once again, we didn't set out to um, make a decision that we would necessarily recommend to anybody else, but we did make a fairly early decision that it was our duty to stay open if we could. And, right. and, uh, and we certainly knew that uh, that might not work. You know, we were never going to take reckless risks with the health of any student, faculty member or staff person or anybody in their community around us. And, uh, and yet um, we believed that it's our job here to help these young people move as quickly as possible um, uh, through a growth process that allows them to launch their lives successfully and that it would be a, a default of that duty to simply throw in the towel at the front end and say it's too chancy, uh, you know, you're going to have to add a year, uh, postpone your, your life really by a year or more. And, um, and I, I also, the, it was fairly clear, I thought, and, and we gathered some of our best scientists to look at this at the very front end, even when none of us knew much. It was pretty, it was beginning to be clear early that this particular virus, as dangerous as it was in certain categories, was not dangerous much at all to the young people who predominate on our campus. So if we'd been running a nursing home, I, we'd have had a very different situation, but we were at the sure. other end of the spectrum with an average age on campus in the 20s and an average age even in our surrounding area uh, in the low 30s. Right. And so we we thought that we ought to give it a try. And here's another place where many years in, in business and the private life in private life, I think was helpful. I looked at the um, the uh, implementation job we were going to have to go through to do this well. and. I just concluded that we had to make an early decision. We had to, we had to, uh, uh, we had so much work to do. We had to stand up. We don't have a medical school here. We had to stand up an entire uh, COVID apparatus from scratch, T uh, testing, tracing, quarantining of those who were going to be temporarily out of service, a whole system. So those 
students didn't lose time. They could keep, they could switch to online and, and then back in uh, to the regular uh, course, all this and more. And so uh, in, in view of the fact that it might not work, and we said, look, the minute we see um, that this is not working, we'll have to join the parade and, you know, take a year out or shut down. Um, one, one, to me, very uh, obvious step that I was, to this day, I'm astonished others didn't do the same. Um, I said to our folks, what, what matters to me the most is uh, not whether a lot of people get a little bit sick, but if anybody gets really ill. So they, they, I, I asked them to set up a severity index, one to six, one, zero, one was asymptomatic, you know, two was one symptom, three was two symptoms, six was candidate for the hospital. And we watched that very, very carefully. If we had ever seen a significant number of people in real danger, then we probably would have, you know, gone back to to a, a, a more closed situation. So um, I do believe that history will judge harshly many of the, our decision makers in public and private capacities who took what I think was the um, easy way out. Um, instead of balancing priorities, I mean, you've been a major leader, business leader, and I'm sure the people in the audience do. It's all about choices. It's all about priorities. Um, it's all about balancing competing interests. Uh, that's the whole, that's the whole very definition of a position of uh, much responsibility. And, um, you know, I think so many people uh, abdicated that duty. Uh, they, they hid behind uh, alleged experts who only had one thing in mind. How do we have the fewest number of cases? And uh, I, I didn't consider all the collateral damage they might be doing, all the other harm that might come uh, that need to be considered in the balance. Yeah, yeah, it, it, exactly. And one of your uh, one of your quotes is, is kind of what you started with. Boilermakers don't scar easily, <laughs> you know, and, uh, uh, you know, meaning you know, they, they stand up and take it and lead when 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 necessary and uh, where necessary uh, and make those sorts of choices. Uh, and and I, I remember just watching from a distance at the time as you were going through that and the things you were saying, just so, uh, you know, so grateful for uh, people who are balancing, uh, you know, decisions. And, and as you know, we're never going to get every decision right. You, you, you know, leaders are going to be wrong. I learned that early on. <laughs> but right. you got to make a decision. No, we made all kinds of mistakes, and some of them were kind of comical to look back on. Again, none of us knew that much. And you know, you, you know, a basic rule of business or life, I think, Doug, is that, uh, uh, and I tell our students all the time, you know, we love data around here. We like to gather it and analyze it. And it's, it's a core skill of, of life. We teach it to every student now. doesn't matter what you're studying. We want you to be a, a data analyst, at least fluent. Right. Well, um, I also tell them, you are probably never going to, confront a significant decision with all the data you'd like to have. Right. At some point, if you wait till that, if you wait till you have everything you need to, you think you need to know, somebody else already has the customer, somebody else has already captured the market, you know, um, somebody else has, um, you know, beaten you to the punch. Right. So, um, uh, we, uh, again, uh, we did some things that looking back didn't do any darn good at all. And I laugh about some of them. I mean, I was out bragging about how much plexiglass we had bought and we're putting it up everywhere. Well, a year or two later, the data says, you know, that probably didn't stop much of anything. <laughs> we moved beds in. I, I feel badly. All the all the workers who went into all our residence halls, somebody calculated that you could really reduce the likelihood of spread if you had more distance between the, you know, let's say there are two people sleeping in the same room. All right. So we moved whatever it was, 15, 20,000 beds. So they'd be <laughs> op at opposite ends. Probably didn't make any difference. If you're in the same room, you probably caught it. Things like that. <laughs> yeah. and well, scrubbing so down counters like, 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 like madmen. And, uh, and then, you know, it turns out it doesn't really spread much that way. But who knew? So we did everything we could. And you're right. You, when you tackle a problem like that, you're probably going to make some mistakes. You just have to 
own up to them and uh, don't don't make them twice. Yeah, exactly right. Learn from them and and move on. Yeah. yeah. But but again, I think that's a really interesting chapter, uh, you know, in you know, Purdue's recent history about uh, you know, and, and as I appreciate your duty, you know, to to the mission and that we had a duty to fulfill and you had a duty yeah. to fulfill and you were going to figure out how to do it in the best way possible without being reckless. You know, I, I think that's, uh, you know, we all take measured risks in life. And I, I remember you talking about there's other risks on campus that that population faces. It's not just a, a, a COVID or infection risk. And there's other risks that we all face in life. Uh, Absolutely. So and the, and the evidence choices. is just, you're right. And the evidence has just been piling up and piling up, uh, you know, worldwide, frankly, but across society of, uh, we'll be finding out for a very long time about very real human costs. You know, forget economic costs, which were horrendous. Human costs. The um, I just saw today that deaths from alcohol in the sub-65 population exceeded deaths from COVID wow. over this period. And the 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 scientists who produced this are you know, demonstrate that they these deaths jumped up, and clearly many are COVID related. There's just in so many examples. But what are what are K-12 kids lost? And somebody better be working on how to catch them up because it doesn't happen naturally or automatically. So um, I, I believe, you know, years from now. Um, Social scientists and, and scientists here will be still be tabbing up the consequence of one dimensional thinking, refusal to uh, try to wrestle with the really difficult uh, balancing questions we discussed. Yeah, yeah, ab absolutely. And then and I love this way you talked about, boy, if you're kind of, you know, try not to have any risk at all, you're not going to take any risk at all. You know, yeah. it's just a great, great summation. Yeah. Right. I mean, uh, this country was built by by people who took enormous risks, you know, got in leaky boats. Some of them didn't get here at all, you know, landed with nothing and uh, on, on taking the chance that they could uh, find a, a, a first rung on the ladder and all the rest. marched off into the wilderness, knowing, not knowing what dangers they were exposing themselves to and often losing their lives. But uh, we ever lose that sense of. Uh, of, of risk taking and adventure, uh, we, we got big problems. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Let, let me shift gears again in, in another phase of innovation, maybe switching towards more uh, uh, of the policy side of things, and it's particularly with, with regard to students' loans. You talked about it earlier. But what you know, what started as a, a great way to kind of encourage people to get you know a, a college education in the 1970s, you know, you know, take out this loan, get the support, um, you, you know, has really turned into a you know into a, a, a place now. It's a hugely uh, you know political topic, um, you know, and you know, there's a lot of people who who took out their student loans and paid back their student loans. I know there's yeah. a lot of people today who, where, where some people say, well, they shouldn't pay their student loans and college should be free. Help us understand your perspective on, uh, uh, you know, on, on a, from a policy perspective, how we as a, a, a nation or citizens should be thinking about our role in, in helping, uh, in, in helping or connecting, uh, you know, people with the opportunity to have a higher education, a college education. Right. Well, I do have strong views about this, and they start where you did, Doug. The, uh, the graduates of Purdue University are 99% certain to pay back their student loans. Um, the people who, uh, the vast, vast majority of people who took out loans and aren't paying them back knew what they were getting into or certainly were on notice. Yeah, there were a few at the edges who might have been actively misled, but, you know, most uh, knowingly uh, borrowed that money, and uh, if they made a bad calculation, it was it was their own. Uh, the idea of uh, uh, wantonly uh, forgiving these, I think, is wrong in every dimension. I mean, uh, uh, first of all, it's uh, uh, it's uh, I think ethically wrong uh, to uh, uh, it t teaches a terrible moral lesson that uh, people can take on an obligation like that and then just walk away from it particularly when many others honored their own commitments. Uh, it's, uh, it's absolutely sure to be uh, 
um, unfair in the sense that well-to-do people will benefit substantially. In fact, probably more. They'll probably have more money forgiven. And so it's, uh, it's a very uh, inequitable thing to do. And then, you know, finally, it's a huge injustice to the American taxpayer. You know, when the federal government took over the loan program, they told everybody it was going to make a profit. Oh, this is a smart thing to do. Of course, it's a colossal loser. Um, they'll make it more so as they if they start forgiving loans that otherwise uh, are supposed to be paid back. And what that is, frankly, is an, an appropriation by the executive branch. No, uh, that is to say, they're spending taxpayer dollars. That that's who will pick up the tab um, instead of the individuals who undertook these obligations. So um, if it sounds like I don't uh, have a lot of use for those suggestions, I guess that's correct. <laughs> but you've also come back, and I appreciate that. Thank you, thank you for sharing that, because it's hard for us to understand the enormity, even the size. You know, you're talking one and a half trillion dollars. You know, it's hard to hard to grasp the size of a million, let alone a billion. Now you're talking about a trillion, and and you're right, all the dimensions across which it could be a challenge. But you're trying to respond with innovative ways for people to pay or for others to invest in a student um, yeah. so that so that they can have an education. Help us understand how you're thinking about some of the new ways to do it rather than, yeah. you know, what's, uh, what's out there in the policy world right now. Yeah, well, you're referring to income share agreements, which yes. I'll describe. I'll just say there's an old way and a new way to deal with this. The, the old way, I always say, if, if you want to control student debt, don't charge so darn much in the first place. Right. <laughs> you know, um, We've uh, it, uh, cumulatively over the 10 years that we have um, controlled student expenses here, uh, actually lowered them here at Purdue, um, someone calculated that if we had gone up at the, uh, at the average of our peer group, uh, Purdue families now would have spent a, a cumulatively a, a billion dollars more than they have. Huh. So there's money, a lot of that money would have been borrowed if we had uh, not done what we did. So there's that. Income share agreements um, are an old idea that nobody had tried, so we did. Uh, they, um, um, uh, the simple way I uh, usually describe it is they are equity as opposed to debt. So the student doesn't borrow any money. The student signs an agreement with an, a, an investor. Usually it's a, in our case, it's our foundation, which has raised then some funds for this purpose, uh, and agrees to pay um, a specified percentage of income, whatever that income is, for a specified number of years after graduation. So the risk is shifted entirely from the student or the graduate to the investor. If the student has no income, he pays nothing. You know, if if he goes off uh, uh, to uh, you know Tibet to find himself, uh, that's the problem. That's the investor's problem. Right. Um, if he had a student loan. The loan would be sitting there. It would be compounding every day that uh, uh, of his life. So um, th that's to me the most attractive thing. It has other features that I think are very uh, positive. Uh, if we could make it large enough, over time the market would begin to tell future students uh, what they valued more. Which is to say, um, and, and we had to sort of jury rig this based on historical data. But somebody who's very likely to earn a larger income, let's say an aeronautical engineer or a, a computer science graduate, um, will be asked in the agreement for a smaller percentage and probably for a shorter time right. uh, because it, it's more likely to, um, they're, they're highly likely to uh, be in demand, get a good job and uh, pay this very affordable amount. Remember, the student agrees to this. It's an, it's an affordable percentage, whether they make a lot of money or a little. Right. And, uh, you know, conversely, someone who studied something that um, at the time was seen as less valuable is going to be asked to, in, in any agreement to pay a higher percentage of what's expected to be a lower, um, lower earnings. But in any case, the, the risk shifts from the student. The risk knows the student has frozen exactly their obligations and protected themselves in a way that's not possible with conventional loans. Yeah. You, you know, I remember a friend looked at the possible degrees when, when I was in school. 
went right to the potential income from each of those degrees and said, here's what I'm going to do. Yeah. <laughs> and that was yeah, their well, decision. Smart, yeah, a lot of smart students do it now. And all this, this would do is bring the finance, if they need more finance, uh, into line with that. You know, we never recommend it. Uh, uh, in, in lieu of a subsidized student loan, those are still, with your, when your fellow taxpayers are picking up part of the cost, you know, you can't beat those. But for many students, that's not enough and they need to borrow more. And that's where a lot of them get into trouble. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, it, again, just a, another example of an innovative idea of trying to help solve the problem uh, of high costs and, and making higher ed accessible to more and more people. Uh, you know, Mitch, as we, as we wrap here, and I'm so grateful for your, your time uh, to, to talk with us about these things, to help us understand, help us to get an understanding so we can kind of land on where we all believe, all of us in the audience, what we mm -hmm. believe about this topic, because it, it, it's so important. Help us to maybe just kind of close with what you see as the role of higher ed uh, in our society. You know, how, you know, you know how even if we're not getting a degree, even if we're not getting the education, how should we just as a citizen step back and say, what's the value, what's the role that this mm -hmm. education experience, and if it's not just higher ed, maybe all of educate, what role does that play in our society and why should we be paying attention, caring uh, 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 about these discussions or these debates? I think to answer in one sense, to produce productive high character citizens. Um, and um, so that means uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, transmit the skills and the knowledge that, uh, that uh, uh, young people uh, need to be productive. It should include um, some grounding in the, um, in the ways and means of a free society, which higher ed is doing a terrible job, almost a counterproductive job in too many cases of. Here at Purdue, starting this year, um, with this year's freshmen, it's optional for their upper class colleagues, but starting with this year's freshmen, sometime during their time at Purdue, they will, as a requirement of graduation, they'll have to pass a fairly straightforward test on civics, civics literacy. and. Um, uh, it's, it's not onerous or burdensome, but, uh, you know, it, we think it is a, a part of our responsibility to send out not only people who uh, uh, can uh, write brilliant computer code or uh, uh, devise the next uh, uh, leap forward in precision agriculture or, um, or, or, or even, um, you know, simply be great uh, leaders of businesses, uh, talented business people, but uh, people who are um, uh, aware of their responsibilities and of the mechanisms of a free society, the kind that uh, underlies all the things they hope to do in life. Right. And um, uh, that's something that was once pretty well understood uh, in the K-12 system. It's disappeared there. There are even places where, as I say, I think people, young people are being taught uh, poorly, uh, taught uh, dishonestly even about our history and about our civic traditions. Many of them arrive here not knowing much of anything about uh, the uh, system which has made a, a, a great, great uh, country possible. So that's what it's about. For a few institutions like ours, not all, but um, it's not just about transmitting knowledge, but about generating new knowledge. And so that's, that's something we take very seriously here. So we have some fantastic researchers pressing out the boundaries of, of what is known. Uh, all the time. Um, but the uh, I, I would say the core mission for colleges of all kinds uh, everywhere is the one I just mentioned. And, and I, uh, I hope we'll we'll see more attention to that. Uh, because many have have, as our conversation is, has uh, frequently um, mentioned have uh, many people are now uh, very uh, dubious that that job is being well done. Yeah, yeah. And, and there's, you know, there's, you know, enough visibility to those things. As you said, people are, you know, being taught dishonestly or, or some things that are happening 
um, that, that again, you know, citizens are seeing and watching and wondering mm-hmm. then about the industry or the whole scope of, of higher ed. But Mitch, thank you so much for locking in and being so, you know, uh, so passionate and straightforward about, you know, the roles, responsibilities, and, and the performance of, of what a major university like Purdue is doing. So a- any other thoughts that you'd want to share with our, with our audience as we kind of wrap things up here? Just, uh, I'm, again, so grateful for this conversation. All my other thoughts right now are about basketball. So uh, <laughs> I, hope, I hope by the time the audience sees this, um, they all know how to say boiler up. All right. All right. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm with you there. Uh, so, you know, we, we could have a whole nother episode on, you know, on, on sports and the impact yeah. on in a university or on in society. But uh, I, I hear you on that one. Uh, you know, Ms. Daniels, uh, president of Purdue University, thank you so much for taking your time. Thanks for helping us get a better understanding uh, of the work you're doing, the innovation that, that you are, are part of uh, and sparking and the importance of the role of higher education and expanding knowledge. I, I love that piece as well of just not just, you know, sharing, but expanding, finding new things. Mm-hmm. And we can be very proud as I, I'm very proud as a Boilermaker to be part of that tradition. I don't know what I'm doing to help it too much. I'm trying not to hurt it, uh, but uh, I'm, I'm grateful to be part of it. So thank you for your time. Enjoyed it. Great, thanks. And thank you all for joining us, uh, our time with Mitch Daniels, president of Purdue University. Uh, Thanks for joining us. We'll look forward to seeing you soon on the next episode of Believe.